majority of this subcortex workshop. Um, just a brief recap of the format of the sessions. I'll start by giving a short introduction to the topic. And then we have three speakers today who will talk about 30 minutes each, um, followed by a short discussion and a time for questions for about 15 minutes. Um, before every new presentation, I'll try to schedule in a little break so that we can uh, stretch our legs and get a drink or relax your eyes a little bit. If you want to ask questions, please use the chat window. Um, and of course, I'll try to keep an eye on the time. So the topic of this final session is um, uncovering subcortical behavior, or in other words, trying to understand the contributions of subcortical areas to cognition. And more generally, I think you can argue that um, understanding how cognition arises from the entire brain is one of the sort of core end goals of neuroscience. And if we focus on cortex, I think we've actually come quite some way in this understanding. So in this study, for example, the authors uh, parcelated um, the human cerebral cortex uh, in 180 distinct regions based on multimodal MRI data from um, HCP. And for each of these regions, they were able to identify how much they were part of, say, visual networks and of auditory networks and of sensory motor networks. Plus, the underlying uh, MRI data also contained task fMRI data. So they had some tasks that were, for example, language tasks, which could be used to identify which regions are involved in language comprehension. Just an example. Now, of course, there are many, many open questions about uh, cortex, about the functioning of cortex. So I'm, I'm definitely not trying to claim here that we're done studying cortex, but I think that we can argue that if you ask this, this simple question of which cortical regions do, sub, do sort of which cognitive functions, um, I do think that the literature does have quite some um, answers. Um, but of course, there's this, this, this large hole in this map, which is subcortex. So if we ask the same question, namely, which subcortical areas are involved in which functions, um, I think the literature has a, lot, a lot more difficulty in uh, providing answers. This is one example uh, where they try to find answers. Um, this, is a, this is a meta analysis from Max Koeken and colleagues who queried PubMed by uh, searching for 424 subcortical areas combined with MRI. So they only squared for um, MRI studies. And they found a total of over 37,000 publications, which could together um, cover 145 of these subcortical air structures. Now, the graph on the left is an illustration of this entire body of literature and the relative size of these areas for each of these uh, structures correspond to uh, the relative size of, of, of the publications in this body. So already you can appreciate that um, the majority of these studies are focused on a minority of the subcortical structures, the butamen and the striatum and the thalamus and the pons and the caudate together cover 57% of all these publications. Um, a second thing to note is that they also uh, checked uh, the, for the proportions of these studies that contained um, cognitive keywords. And what you can then see in color here are the probabilities of cognitive keywords being asso associated with these regions. And in general, these probabilities are not very high. There is one exception, which is uh, the ventral striatum or the nucleus accumbens, which is often studied in, in reward and reinforcement learning. But more generally, many of these studies are uh, not on cognition. On the right, then you see an attempt to map structures on the x-axis, uh, sorry, functions on the x-axis to structures on the y-axis, um, which gives this sort of this very scattered overview. There are a lot of cognitive functions attributed to um, subcortex, um, but it's it, there's no sort of clear mapping between functions on the one hand and structures on the other. So. I think it, you can argue that our understanding of the function of subcortex is a lot more sparse and a lot more scattered than our understanding of the function of cortex. And I think it's worthwhile to, to wonder a little bit why this is the case. One factor contributing here, I think, is that it is much more difficult to uh, measure the function of subcortex compared to cortex. So if you use um, healthy, healthy human beings as your volunteers, as your subjects, then of course you're bound to using non-invasive methods. And if you use non-invasive methods, then by definition, you're recording from the outside of the skull and subcortex is somewhere roughly in the middle of the skull. So you have this large distance. And 
um, the, the electrical and magnetic fields caused by LFPs in the subcortex are very small and commonly considered to even be too small to be reliably measured using EEG and MEG. There is, of course, some work that suggests that this is possible, but in general, the cognitive neuroscientist that aims to study healthy humans and subcortex uses fMRI. But this distance is also for fMRI an issue, because uh, also in fMRI, your receiver coils are on the outside of the brain. So in, the, in this plot, for example, you can see TSNR values across the brain, and just very hand wavy TSNR is roughly an index of signal quality. Uh, then irrespective of the scanner settings, which are the different columns here, uh, the, the signal quality in cortex is almost always higher than in subcortex. So one could argue then that perhaps we should um, abandon non-invasive methods. Perhaps we should just focus on invasive methods to uh, use electrode recordings, for example, uh, in, for example, non-human primates or rodents. And of course, this, this, these methods have led to very valuable insights in neuroscience, uh, some of which I'll just show in a moment. But um, this type of research, of course, has its own just set of challenges. So not all animals can learn all tasks. And if an animal can learn a task, uh, it requires extensive training combined with expensive facilities. So data are very costly. And uh, also these, these, these recordings are somewhat of a different level of understanding. They are very detailed on a neuronal level, but uh, recordings uh, usually are from a relatively limited set of neurons, uh, for samples from a relatively limited set of regions from a relatively limited number of animals. So it's a little bit more difficult to get this sort of systems level overview of, um, uh, of the brain. Now, I think then that in subcortex, we have a measurement problem that is a little bit larger than we have in, in cortex. Um, so perhaps we should devote part of our, our efforts to optimizing the methods that we do have available. But recording, of course, isn't um, the only thing. Because as neuroscientists, we don't just record data, we also need to interpret these data. And if you wish, then we interpret these data through what you could say, the lens of our theories. It is our theories that allow us to make sense of data that otherwise could be uninterpretable. And here I think that formal model development is really a key component in trying to understand the brain in general. And this, of course, also applies to um, subcortex. And I'd like to briefly just show two examples of how in the past uh, models have helped the interpretation of neural data. Um, one is this, are these hallmark findings in neuroscience by Wolfram Schultz and colleagues in the late 90s, uh, where they recorded from um, dopamine neurons in the dopaminergic midbrain, and they showed that the behavior of these neurons, the firing rates of these neurons, they, they correspond very closely to the dynamics that were formalized by um, reinforcement learning models. Just very briefly, the idea was, or the, their observation was, that these neurons increased their firing rates uh, when an unexpected reward occurred, and they decreased their firing rates when there was an unexpected omission of a reward. But more importantly, I think that these, uh, these um, firing rates also increased in response to a state transition. So it's transition from an unrewarding state to a rewarding state. So it's not the reward per se that causes these increases and decreases, but it's, it's these straight state transitions, even if uh, it's only a re reward expectancy. So even if the reward is um, delayed. And these, these behaviors of these neurons, they really appear to very closely mimic the concept of prediction errors that was formalized in the, in the reinforcement learning literature in the 80s. <clears throat> the second example are these uh, recordings done by Josh Gold and Mike Shetland and many others who uh, showed in the late 90s that neurons in the monkey area LIP appear to implement some sort of integrate to threshold like firing behavior when these monkeys were making uh, perceptual decisions. Um, just very briefly, the, the idea was that these monkeys were making these decisions, so they were looking at a rendered up kinetogram, and uh, for the first roughly 200 milliseconds, these neurons didn't do anything sort of decision specific, but then afterwards there was this ramp-like increase in activity, and the, the steepness of this ramp depended on the, the difficulty of the decision, and just moments before the monkey made its choice, these uh, firing rates reach a common level of activity irrespective of the motion strength, so irrespective of the difficulty, and also irrespective of the um, decision time. Now, at the time, these uh, recordings were interpreted in terms of the diffusion decision model of um, decision making. 
But more recently, um, there have been alternative proposals. And one is the proposal in terms of the urgency gating model, which was uh, developed by Paul Sisek uh, and colleagues in 2009. And their core proposal was that these signatures, or sorry, these, these firing rates are not just a signature of pure evidence integration, but they reflect a combination of the momentary sensory evidence plus a rapidly growing um, urgency signal. So it is really urgency here that we're looking at and not necessarily the integration of sensory evidence. Um, <clears throat> so what reinforcement learning and these decision-making models have in common is that you could say, well, these are models that model the uh, algorithmic level of understanding. So we're looking here at models that formalize the algorithms that the brain is hypothesized to implement. Uh, but these models are agnostic when it comes to the actual implementation in the brain itself. There is a second class of models, which is sometimes called the neurocomputational models, uh, which focus much more on this implementational level. So here the idea is that uh, you formalize, you implement cortical and subcortical units or areas in, uh, in a computer, and then you can simulate such networks. And then via simulation, you can figure out which uh, connect connectivity patterns between regions and which types of interaction between regions can lead to uh, behavior that resembles neural and behavioral uh, real data. So on the left here, you see one example, which is a cortical basal ganglia network uh, by Rafael Bogac and colleagues in 2007, where uh, this is a model of action selection. And just very briefly, the idea was that um, uh, different actions are represented in terms of their saliencies in cortex and these saliencies are fed forward to uh, the basal ganglia output nodes, which disinhibits um, responses. But there is a second part of this network, which consists of the SDN and the globus pallidus, which uh, detects conflict. So if there's multiple action uh, options which uh, compete, um, the SDN uh, um, inhibits the basal ganglia output nodes uh, choices such that uh, pre uh, premature responses are prevented. <clears throat> Just finally, I'd like to show this, this second example, which I think is by now a classical example of such a great neural computational model, which is this uh, cortical basal ganglia thalamo cortical loops model, which was proposed by Michael Frank in the early 2000s, uh, which is also a model of action selection, and it proposes that uh, if there are multiple competing action options, then these are represented in a premotor cortex, and this competition is resolved via loops, via the striatum, then uh, via the direct and indirect pathway to the uh, globus pallidus interna, then to thalamus, and then back to uh, premotor cortex. And it's this delicate balance between uh, excitation from the direct pathway and, in and inhibition from the indirect pathway that allows for the resolvement of this uh, competition. Um, and this network is modulated by uh, the, the, the level of dopamine in the system that originates from the substantia nigra. And by uh, manually or manipulating the total dopamine in the system, they were able to show that this, this model can produce behavior that is qualitatively very similar to the behavior of Parkinson's disease patients in a probabilistic um, selection task. So this is, I think, now a classical model and can be found in many textbooks on neuroscientists. I'm, I'm sure you've all seen this before. So <clears throat> with this brief introduction, I hope to not only have shown um, the topic of today, but also some of the early work of our speakers of today, who I'm very glad to announce are here to tell us more about their more recent endeavors. Um, they are Rafael Bogac of the University of Oxford, uh, Michael Frank of Brown University, and Paul Sisek of the University of Montreal. I'm looking forward very much to all your talks, um, and I would now like to ask Rafael to start sharing your screen.